Sutlej Medal, named after the river around which the conflict was fought, was awarded to British and Indian troops following the First Anglo-Sikh War of 1845-46. The war can best be described as a clash of empires. The foundations of the Sikh Empire go back to the early 1700s, but it was under the leadership of Maharaja Ranjit Singh that it really reached its zenith. His ascendancy, following his father's death, marked the unification and modernization of the region. Both his army and government included all religions, Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims, and peace and prosperity were the result. The British Empire had advanced steadily through India, and the two empires met at an unofficial border along the Sutlej River. Throughout Ranjit Singh's rule, the two empires maintained a friendly and peaceful relationship, neither one wanting or able to advance into each other's territory. In 1839, Ranjit Singh died, and almost immediately the area descended into chaos. His son and heir was unpopular and removed from power after a few months and later died in prison. There followed a series of political assassinations, with the end result being that the army ended up in control of the kingdom. The Sikh army expanded rapidly in the aftermath of Ranjit Singh's death, from 29,000 in 1839 to over 80,000 in 1845, and this was a worry to the British authorities in the region. Their main concern was that the Sikh army, without strong leadership to restrain them, was a serious threat to the British territories along the border. Immediately after the death of Ranjit, the British began increasing its military strength, particularly in the regions adjacent to the Punjab, establishing a military cantonment at Ferozhapur, only a few miles from the Sutlej River. Inevitably, this seemingly aggressive British military build-up at the border had the effect of increasing tensions within the Punjab and the Sikh army. After mutual demands and accusations between the Sikhs and the British, diplomatic relations were broken. The British army began marching towards Ferozhapur, where a division was already stationed. In response to the British move, the Sikh army began crossing the Sutlej on the 11th of December 1845. The Sikhs claimed they were only moving into Sikh possessions on the east side of the river, but the British regarded the move as clearly hostile and they declared war. Having crossed the river, the Sikh army of nearly 50,000 strong stopped and took up position at the village of Ferozhahar, 15 kilometres from the garrison at Ferozapur. Fortunately, they did not attack the outpost, as at a strength of only 7,000 men, the inevitable outcome would have been unpleasant. The British army, under the overall command of Sir Hugh Gough, marched from various bases in the region and concentrated on the area around Mudki, 30 kilometres from Ferozhapur, with the aim of relieving the garrison, but on arrival learned that the Sikhs were moving towards them with 10,000 of their number with the aim of halting their advance. So the exhausted British force, also numbering around 10,000 men, took up position in front of the village and waited the Sikhs' arrival. The Battle of Mudki started late in the day on the 18th of December 1845. It was an inconclusive affair that started with both sides employing cavalry attacks that were followed by an advance by the British infantry. With night closing in, the British succeeded in driving the Sikhs back, capturing 17 guns in the process. The Sikhs retreated to Ferozhahar while the British held Mukhi. British killed and wounded totaled 872, including several senior commanders. Three days later, on the 21st of December, the British moved from Mudki and advanced towards the Sikhs at Ferozhahar. The garrison at Ferozhapur was ordered to do likewise and meet up with the main force. However, the garrison did not start moving until mid-morning and the two did not join until about 1.30 in the afternoon when the combined British army, now numbering around 17,000 men, faced the whole Sikh army, 45,000 strong, entrenched around the village. The Battle of Ferozhahar took place over two days, the 21st and 22nd of December 1845. Due to the late arrival of the Ferozhapur garrison, the start of the battle on the 21st was again late in the day, with an artillery duel at about 4pm, the more numerous and heavier guns of the Sikhs getting the better of the British. 
With the artillery roaring, the British advanced towards and into the enemy encampment under heavy fire, but they took too many casualties and were forced to retire. A renewed advance, led by Sir Harry Smith and with the 50th foot bearing the brunt of the attack, burst through the Sikh lines and after fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting drove them back and captured several guns. They gained ground beyond the village, but as night went on they too were forced to retire. The next morning, as things looked a bit grim for the British, they again formed up and renewed their frontal attack. However, the situation was better than it looked. The Sikhs had been unnerved by Smith's success the previous night and had lost many of their guns. Preceded by another artillery barrage, including rockets, the British line, with Gough himself at the head of the right and Governor-General Sir Henry Harding at the head of the left, swept forward unchecked by return fire right through the Sikh camp, routing all before them. British killed and wounded totaled over 2,400. Sikh wounded is unknown, but suffered over 2,000 dead. Following the battle, the Sikh army retreated back across the Sutlich, while the British camped just north of the battlefield and rested. They were exhausted after the forced marches to the battle sites of Muki and Ferozhahar, and short of ammunition and supplies, both of which arrived on the 6th of January with 10,000 reinforcements. The Sikhs, meanwhile, encouraged by the lack of British forward movement and reinforced by fresh troops, gathered on the north bank of the Sutlich, opposite Sobron. They built a bridge of boats and began to cross, establishing itself on the southern bank, the British unable to stop them from doing so. Further to the east, another small force of Sikhs were threatening the city of Ludhiana. Sir Harry Smith was dispatched towards the area to deal with the problem, on his way forcing a Sikh garrison at Ramkot to surrender. During his march, it was learnt that a large force of Sikhs had crossed the Sutlich at Philor and was advancing towards Ludhiana. Smith continued to march east, bypassing a Sikh position at Badawal, where an exchange of gunfire inflicted about 200 casualties. He successfully reached Ludhiana to relief of the British garrison in the city. Threatened with British reinforcements, the Sikhs fell back to the village of Aliwal. Smith immediately advanced and occupied the abandoned position at Badawal. On the 26th of January 1846, both armies received reinforcements and, two days later, the British army advanced towards the village with about 12,000 men. They faced 20,000 Sikhs, dug in by the village, but with the river at their backs, making it almost impossible for them to manoeuvre. The battle, for the British, was a fairly straightforward one. Smith realised that the Sikh right was their weak point, and so concentrated his attack there. Pushing them back, the centre became exposed, threatening their line of retreat over the river. An attack on the Sikh left pushed them back, leaving the centre to resist, but to no avail. With the flanks collapsing and repeated infantry attacks on the centre, they retreated across the river. It quickly turned into a rout, and all of the enemy guns were either captured or lost in the river. They tried to form a line on the north bank, but came under heavy artillery fire and dispersed. British killed and wounded, total 590. The battle is regarded as the turning point in the conflict, and Smith is quoted as having described it, in part, as I have gained one of the most glorious battles ever fought in India. Smith left his sick and wounded at Aliwal and marched west to rejoin Gough at Soberon, reaching him five days later. He found the Sikh position to be a strong one, covered with well-built entrenchments and 30,000 men with 70 cannon, joined to the north bank of the river where they had reserves of both men and artillery. British morale was helped by the news of the victory of Aliwal. The Sikhs, no doubt not so much so by the sight of their dead comrades floating down the river. On the 10th of February 1846, the Battle of Soberon commenced, with a heavy bombardment from a newly arrived British siege train lasting for about two hours. This was followed by attacks by three British divisions, mainly on the British left where the Sikh defences were the weakest. Initially driven back, the renewed advances broke through the Sikh lines at several points and, as at Aliwal, the Sikhs began to retreat across the bridge of boats. However, with so many men on the bridge and the river swollen, the bridge broke, trapping 20,000 Sikhs on the wrong side, forced to face the advancing British. 
None of the trapped Sikhs' soldiers attempted to surrender. Many fought to the death. Some Sikhs rushed forward to attack the British, sword in hand. Others tried to swim the river. British artillery lined the bank of the river and continued to fire into the crowds in the water. By the time the firing had ceased, the Sikhs had lost about 10,000 men and the British had captured 67 guns. The victory was complete and the British crossed the river that evening. The way to the capital, Lahore, was open and the Sikhs could not regroup fast enough to prevent the advance. The Sikhs sued for peace and on the 29th of March the Treaty of Lahore was signed by Governor-General Sir Henry Harding and the Sikh leadership. The terms of the treaty were punitive. Sikh territory was reduced to a fraction of its former size, losing large amounts of land to the south of the River Sutlej and the forts and territory between the River Sutlej and Bees. In addition, controls were placed on the size of the Lahore army and 36 field guns were confiscated. Control of the river Sutlej and Bees and part of the Indus passed into British hands. The Sikhs paid an indemnity to cover the cost of the war and the British installed their preference of leader to govern at Lahore, albeit under the regency of a British agent, Major Henry Lawrence. For now the war was over, but as in many instances the peace was not to last and the army would once again have to fight in the Punjab. Following the peace, the government in what was now becoming expected practice, approved a medal to all the soldiers who took part and sanction was given by general order dated the 17th of April 1846 for the award of a medal to the Army of the Sutlej. The Sutlej Medal is notable in the history of British medals for several reasons. Firstly, after the impractical iron ring of the Waterloo Medal and the ugly inflexible bar used for the China Medal, this is the first time we see an ornate swivelling suspender, allowing the disc to rotate around its axis. Secondly, it's the first of a series of standard size medals used, with a few exceptions, for the next 60 years. The medal disc is 36mm wide and made from fine silver. The ribbon is 32mm wide. The most important change is the introduction of the battle clasp. The Waterloo Medal was awarded for attendance of any one of three battles, Quatre Bar, Ligny and Waterloo. The China Medal was awarded for nine separate battles. The Sutlej was awarded for four separate battles, but the medal denotes which battle the recipient was at with a combination of the medal reverse and additional battle clasps. There are, in fact, four different reverses. They can be seen here and, at first glance, all look the same. But on closer examination, you can see that in the Exerg, that's a fancy way of describing this small space below the main design, there are four different names and dates of the main battles of the conflict, namely Mudki, 1845, Ferozhahur, 1845, Aliwal, 1846, and Soberon. 1846. This means, of course, that four different metal dies had to be made in order to mint the four different reverses. The main design on the reverse, above these variations, shows a standing figure of victory, facing left, holding a reef in her outstretched right hand. In her left hand, at her side, she holds an olive branch. At her feet, there is a collection of trophies. Around the circumference, in capital letters is the legend, Army of the Sutlej. The medal reverse a soldier received was for the first battle he took part in. If he was present at another following battle, a clasp for that battle was added to the ribbon. For instance, in this example, the soldier was not present at the first battle of Muki because he has the reverse for Ferozhahur, his first battle. He then missed the Battle of Aliwal but was present at Sobron, so the clasp for Sobron is added to the ribbon. In this second example, the man was at the first two battles, so the reverse for Mutki and the clasp for Ferozhahur. He did not attend the last two battles. If you were at all four battles, you got the reverse for Mutki and the clasps for the following three battles. This system of reverse and clasps made the award overly complicated and far more expensive than it needed it to be, so it was the only time it was used. Future awards use standard metal reverses with added appropriate clasps. 
The obverse, or front, of the Sutlej medal is identical to the China medal, a left facing young Queen Victoria with Victoria Regina, literally Victoria the Queen, around the rim. The designer, William Wyon, prints his name on her shoulder. The ribbon is dark blue with crimson edges. The clasps themselves are made individually, again from silver. They have a front faceplate with the battle name and a plain back bar. With the clasp for the Sutlej campaign, there is an ornate rose underneath each side. When the medal was due to have multiple clasps, they were riveted together and to the suspender. The medal ribbon passed between the faceplate and the back bar. The naming style also changes. Gone is the heavy lettering and space filling stars. In its place, a much thinner, leaner, cleaner style. Still done in Roman capitals, the recipient's name, rank and regiment are impressed around the rim. The Sutlej medal I have in my collection was awarded to Sergeant John Brain of the 10th Regiment. The 10th were at Mirat for the first two battles, but were moved into position at Soberon on the 8th of February. They lined up on the British left under command of Major General Robert Dick and made the main attack on the Sikh right where the defences were of soft sand and were lower and weaker than the rest of the line. Dick's division was driven back by Sikh counterattacks after initially gaining footholds within the Sikh lines. As the British fell back, some frenzied Sikh soldiers attacked the British wounded left in the ditch in front of the entrenchments enraging the British soldiers. Dick himself was killed while making a second attack on the Sikh position. The regiment suffered 30 killed in action and another 103 wounded. 778 medals were awarded to the regiment, all of them with the single battle Soberon on the reverse. The regiment underwent several name changes over the years. With the present day incarnation, they are known as the 158th Squadron Royal Logistics Corps, based in Lincoln, appropriately at Soberon Barracks. Join us again next time, where, in order to look forward to our next medal, we have to go back in time to some veterans long overdue their military awards.